Hey, I'm Kev Care, Mr. Kerr. Welcome to Power Oversteer, the most watched show faster than an F1 U turn boat. In this episode, we'll be previewing the second round of the 2016 IndyCar season, the Desert Diamond West Valley Felix Grand Prix, a bit of a mouthful, taking place Saturday night or Sunday morning if you're in Europe, like me, at the Felix International Raceway this weekend. But before we get into that, I didn't manage to get the season preview out on this channel in time before the season opened in St. Peter a few weeks ago. So before we talk about Felix, let's talk IndyCar 2016. Starting with who's driving and where, beginning with the champions. Reigning champion Scott Dixon spearheads Chip Ganassi Racing. The four-time series champion has won two of the last three titles, but a 35-year-old be looking to do something he's never done before this season, retain a title. Every Batman needs a Robin, and for Dixon, that's Tony Kanan. The 41-year-old Bazin is the oldest full-time driver and is one of four drivers in this year's field to have a series title and Indy 500 to his name from 2004 and 2013, respectively. The Iron Man, however, has had a difficult time with Chip Ganassi the past two seasons and will need to add wins this season if he wants to get a top five in the championship. Charlie Kimball spent all five seasons of his IndyCar career with Chip Ganassi. The 31-year-old American get the odd podium throughout the season but a struggle to match his 2013 season where he grabbed his only IndyCar win so far at Mid-Ohio on his way to ninth in the championship. A familiar name for F1 fans rounds out the lineup as Max Chilton sets up to IndyCar of the year in Indy Lights, the final step of the Mazda Road to Indy feeder series. The Brit won in the Oval in Iowa as he got better as the season went on and finished fifth in the championship. The former Man and Russia driver will be the top contender for Rookie of the Year honours given the team he is with, but the 24-year-old has tough competition, as do Chip Ganassi, beginning with Team Penske got painfully close to the title with Ron Pablo Montoya last season, losing out on countback. In their 50th anniversary year, the captain Roger Penske's team would love to put one over on their arch-rival. Montoya may have lost out on the title, but he did win his second Indy 500 after a superb charge through the field. The Colombian stepped up massively after his adjusting year back in single-seaters in 2014, and the 40-year-old will be our favourite for the 500 in title once again. Alongside Montoya on the wrong side of 40 club is Heyo Castro Neves. The Brazilian has been with Penske since 2000, winning three Indy 500s, but has never gotten a title. Unfortunately for him, the competition at the top in IndyCar has just gotten stronger in recent years, and his time could have passed. For Will Power, the time is now. The 2014 champion is renowned for his qualifying pace, but he only grabbed one win last year as he finished third in his title defence year. He has evolved from being only a road and street course racer into a winner on ovals as well, meaning the 35-year-old is a formidable contender. Frenchman Simon Pagano is power from a few years ago. The 31-year-old is always a threat on the road and street courses, but is constantly improving on ovals, as shown by him challenging at the 500 last year. However, that was a rare high point during a difficult first season with Penske, but like his team, continuity and learning from the lessons of last year could hold the key to a much stronger season. A much stronger season is what Andretti Autosport is looking for after a disappointing 2015. However, Ryan Hunter was strong at the end of the season, winning two of the last four races, and the 2012 champion in 2014, Indy 500 winner, is perhaps the team's best chance to challenge for the title. Marco Andretti is celebrating a decade of being in Indy car and has become the consistent one for his father's team. However, he's got only two wins to his name and will need to add more this year if he is to take the step up and challenge for a title. Carlos Munoz is part of a long line of Colombians making a name in IndyCar. The 24-year-old grabbed his maiden win in Detroit last year but suffered an anomalous season. He will need another season like his rookie year in 2014 when he finished in the top 10 in the championship. In the off-season, Brian Hurtel Autosport had a sponsored default so it had to merge with Andretti Autosport to keep his entry alive. Andretti Herta Autosport will have another former Man in Russia F1 driver in their seat. Alexander Rossi was looked at as the next American to drive in F1, which he achieved at the end of last season. However, after being outbid by Rio Harrianto, he's stopping in IndyCar this year and should be part of an exciting rookie battle. The main disadvantage he has to the other young pups is no overall experience, but he should be more at home on the road and street courses. Ray Hall and Edmund Langan Racing were the surprise of last season, managing the challenge for the title with their full-time single-car entry. Graham Ray Hall rocketed back from being mediocre in the previous couple of seasons to win a couple of races and be Honda's only title contender. This year will be about repeating it and proving it wasn't just a blip. Joining Ray Hall in the month of May after his St. Pete outing to Spencer Piggott, the reigning Indy Lights champion has used the scholarship money he got from Mazda for winning that championship to fund these initial outings, and no more could be on the way depending on sponsorship. 
being a young American and all is expected of the 22-year-old, but as Sage Kerm has shown, just establishing himself in IndyCar could be the challenge this year. Smith Peets and Motorsports have the charismatic Canadian James Hinchcliffe leading the charge. His first season with the team was going well until being cut short by an horrific crash during practice for the Indy 500. Thanks to the quick work of the Metro Safety Team and the staff at Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis, the 29-year-old survived and has recovered well so he can be back on top form this season. Alongside him is another returnee, Ricard Eshkin. The rapid Russian had a full-time seat in 2014 and then returned for the season finale at Sonoma last year with the team, finishing 10th. Now he's back full-time and if he can mix his road and street cause ability with the adaptability he showed on the ovals previously, it could be another exciting season to follow the 28-year-old. Another team that could be exciting to follow is AJ Foyt Racing. Takuma Sato and the team seem to be a perfect marriage of inconsistency. The veteran Japanese driver always gets a handful of great results, but the rest can be a mess. It's been his season template since his rookie year in F1 in 2002 and hasn't changed since. Jack Hawksworth joined the team last year and struggled to find any kind of form. With a year's worth of experience with the team, the Brit could find it easier to show the talent he displayed in his rookie year with Brian Herter in 2014. Canadian veteran Alex Tagliani joins the team for the month of May. The 42-year-old normally has good pace around the famous speedway as highlighted by his pole in 2011. Ed to Racing returns as a name this season, and it is basically CFH racing from last year without the F and H. Sarah Fisher and Wink Hartman left in the off-season, leaving Ed Compton in sole charge as he continues to be the only owner-driver in the series. The 35-year-old will be racing only on the overs and needs to improve on last season's showing, or he could be sacked by Ed Carmenter. The team's full-time entry belongs to Joseph Newgarden, who has already won Best Livery of the Year. It was a breakout year for the American last season, with his first two wins in the series on his way to 7th in the championship. Could a 25-year-old do better if the team's focus solely on him most of the season? J.I. Hildebrand is back with the team for the month of May for the third year in a row. He has grabbed the top 10 in the 500 the last couple of years, so look out for him to be strong once again. KVSH Racing have streamlined it down to a single full-time entry this year after wasting money on a disastrous second one the past couple of seasons. Betting on Sebastian Bourdais though could be a wise decision. The 37-year-old won a couple of races last year on his way to a top 10 in the championship and the Frenchman has reveled with the focus on him in the past as his four titles prove. The final full-time team is Delcoin Racing. They were the back market team last year but have a much improved lineup this season. Connor Daly has hung around IndyCar for a couple of years and finally gets his full-time chance. He's part of a strong rookie group and although he's with the smallest team out of the lot, the American has the most IndyCar experience out of all of them, having done the Indy 500 in 2013, then standing in for Hinch in a few races last year. In the second seat for the time being is Italian Luca Firpi. The 30-year-old drove the road course of Ed Carmenter last year with mixed results. There's no doubt in his pace, but he needs to find consistency before he finds himself out the IndyCar door. While Philippi gets his first taste of oval racing this season, Pippa Man joins the team for the fourth year in a row at the 500. Other announced Indy 500 one-offs include Sage Kerm reuniting with Giant Ryan Reinbold Racing. 1996 Indy 500 champion Buddy Lazio returns with his family team at Lazio Partners Racing. Brian Clawson returns with Jonathan Birds Racing. The female run Grace Autosport outfit is running Catherine Legg. And... Matty Brabham will run the whole month of May in an Australian effort with Pytech Team Murray. And yesterday, Townsend Bell got announced with Andretti Autosport in a fifth car. Now we know who's driving. Let's see where they're going to be driving at. This year we say goodbye to Fontana, the big over which had one of the best IndyCar races ever last year. We say goodbye to the Milwaukee Mile, which was the most historic oval on the calendar. And we say goodbye to Nolan Motorsports Park in Louisiana after an inaugural event which was a bit of a washout. However, we say welcome back to a couple of classic venues and hello to an intriguing street race. Yeah, the season started in St. Pete around the streets of Florida a couple of weeks ago and IndyCar returned to Phoenix this weekend. But in just over two weeks time, the 42nd Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach happens around the streets of California with the Honda Indy Grand Prix of Alabama at Barber Motorsports Park a week later. Then, it's the month of May with the Angie's List Grand Prix of Indianapolis round the road course. And the big one, the 100th Indianapolis 500 presented by Pengrade happens on the 29th of May. A week later, the only double header round of the season, the Chevrolet Indy Jewel in Detroit, attacks the streets 
of Bell Isle Park. The second half of the season kicks off with the Firestone 600 at Texas Motor Speedway on the 11th of June, with the return to Road America after almost a decade away, ending the month. The Iowa Corn 300 round the frantic Iowa Speedway falls on the 10th of July, then a week later it's the only visit north of the border to the Street Top Exhibition Place with the Honda Indy Toronto. Back to a road course at the end of the month with the Honda Indy 200 round the picturesque Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course. There's a few weeks break until IndyCar returns to the Pocono Raceway with the ABC Supply 500 on the 21st of August. The Canada ventures into September for the first time since 2013 with the inaugural Grand Prix of Boston around the streets of the Boston Seaport District on the 4th. Then a couple of weeks later the season ends with the GoPro Grand Prix of Sonoma around the undulating road course for the second year running. There are also changes in the IndyCar hierarchy as Mark Miles starts to really put his stamp on the series. After two and a half years, Derek Walker resigned as president of operations and competition and was replaced by Jay Fry in November 2015. Fry has a rich history in American motorsport on the business and management side. He's worked with Valve Line, racing the oil lubricant, and then in NASCAR, he was chief executive officer and general manager of MB2 Motorsports from 1996 till 2007. Then Vice President and General Manager at Red Bull Racing from 2008 to 2011 before coming to IndyCar in 2013 as Chief Revenue Officer of Holman Motorsports. He helped bring Verizon on board as the title sponsor in 2014 and expanded partnerships with companies such as engine manufacturer Tag Heuer. His new role sees him leading the operations, competition and technical matters for the series. While the man he succeeded Derek Walker was a well respected man in the paddock, having been a team owner, manager for most of his career, he didn't feel he got the support from the series to carry out his role. Fry came into the role having been part of the series hierarchy so he shouldn't have the same problems and with lots of paddock experience in NASCAR it would be interesting to see how good this relationship with the IndyCar team owners goes. We looked in the off season Roger Penske who knows him well from his NASCAR days seems to have already been won over so he's already got the big dog on his side. On paper it's a great appointment from Miles and I'm looking forward to see what he can do in the next few years. Overseeing all engineering and technical operations is Bill Pappas who replaced Will Phillips as Vice President of Competition and Race Engineering in March. During his 30 years in motorsport he has worked with the likes of Chip Ganassi Racing, winning the Indy 500 in 2000 with Ron Pablo Montoya, Ray Hornet Lanigan Racing and was technical director for KVSH Racing last season. He's most famous for his partnership with the late Justin Wilson at Dale Coyne Racing when as his race engineer they got Dale Coyne's first win at Watkins Glen in 2009 and the team's first oval win at Texas in 2012. I'm a big fan of Pappas the engineer so we're not fault fry for choosing him but as Walker showed, sometimes being good in the paddock doesn't necessarily mean things will go seamlessly when in a series role. Let's hope it does though for Pappas as he's overlooking an important period for the series with continued growth despite the divisive aero kits and then having to work out the next generation car. Jay Fry has changed race control as he aims for consistency, clarity and transparency from it going forward. In February he appointed a permanent three-man stewarding panel that will be at every round of the calendar. Former Ford Racing boss Dan Davis is the chief steward, the team leader who will be in charge of administration and organisation of the group. Joining him is two-time Indy 500 winner Ari Leindijk and three-time kart race winner Max Pappas. The stewards report to Fry who will be in race control during races and they all have an equal vote when making a stewarding decision. Race director Brian Barnhart is independent of the stewards so will no longer be involved in the stewarding decisions to the delight of everyone I imagine. However Barnard as well as a race steward can call for a review. The three stewards will review the incident and decide if there needs to be a penalty from a predefined list of rules and regulations that have been released to the public just a few days ago as part of the increased transparency and clarity. The decision is then reported to Barnard who will convey the outcome to the competitors and media. Punishments are more black and white with less grey areas in a condensed rule book. Penalties will also be delivered on the day apart from post-race infringement. Last year it became a bit of a joke waiting until Wednesday for punishments, mostly fines, to be announced. Finally, race control has been upgraded to avoid situations such as Graham Rahal avoiding a penalty for leaving the pits 
with a part of a fuel nozzle still jammed in his refueling point at Fontana last year because it wasn't shown on Race Control's TV bank. All of these changes involving race control on the stewards look great and should help deliver the consistency, clarity and transparency that J. Fry wants from it. Not a change, but Honda has signed on for three more years. Has been a fantastic partner for IndyCar, even during the dark period of being a spec series a few years back. Honda has not only contributed engines and aero kits to the series, but also sponsorship and marketing to a number of events, including the rounds at Alabama, Toronto and Mid-Ohio this year. It is brilliant to see a Japanese company stick with IndyCar despite getting beat by Chevrolet in recent years and it is important for the series as there are not many manufacturers looking to jump on board. If Honda left, that would leave an almost too large a hole for IndyCar to fill. And it wouldn't have been a new season without some rule changes. IndyCar has made quite a few safety changes to the cars. In light of the incident that came Justin Wilson's life at Pocono, more tethers have been added to them. The rear beam wing and rear wheel guards are tethered at all races. At super speedways such as Indianapolis, Texas and Pocono, the nose and front wing main plates will also be tethered. Why this isn't oh so mandatory at every racetrack, I don't understand as debris is a problem everywhere. Dome skids will be added to the bottom of the cars at Indy, Texas and Pocono to increase stability. These were last seen on an Indy car in 2011 and reduced the chance of lifting but mainly slowed down the rotation of a car in a spin. The addition of the dome skids and titanium rub blocks means the ride height of the cars will be increased by at least 9mm. Not every engineer is happy about this move that was approved by former VP of competition Will Phillips who is no longer with IndyCar. Wing flaps like those used in NASCAR have been added to help reduce the chance of cars flying like we saw in Indy 500 practice last year. The flaps attached to the rear beam wing and is another device only used at Indy, Texas and Pocono. Finally, the push to pass system has 20 more horsepower this season, up from 40 to 60. Drivers are still limited to just 10 per race, with information about how many push to passes the driver has only known by their crew, if I remember correctly. I think that's the essentials about this season covered. In the next month, we should know more about the drivers for the 500, so buckle up. As a hype train for the 100th Indy 500 is about to go into overdrive. But IndyCar isn't just about the Indy 500, however much ABC tried to tell you. I'm looking at you, Eddie Cheerleader for High Achiever. As we move on to the preview for American Single Seater Racing's return to Phoenix after 11 years away. The structure of these round previews will be similar to what I did in 2013. So let's begin with some track facts. Phoenix International Raceway was built on the outskirts of Avondale, Arizona in 1964 to become the western home of open wheel racing. The oval track originally had a 2.5 mile road course which was removed and replaced by a 1.51 infield road course in 1991. In 1997 ownership of the track was taken over by the NASCAR Associated International Speedway Corporation from Emmett Joby. Despite being a NASCAR track in recent years, Phoenix International Raceway has over 40 years of single-seater history, beginning with 1964. The USAT Championship visited in March, and AJ Foyt and a Watson Offey won the inaugural 100 of that race. However, Al Unzer would become the king of the one-mile tri-oval. Big Al won his first race there in 1969, and repeated that success in 1970, 71, 76, 79, and 1985 to make it six wins. Behind him are legendary names in American open wheel racing with Gordon Johncock on five wins and a number of drivers on four including Foyt, Mario Andretti, Johnny Waterford, Bobby Unzer, Tom Seaver and Rick Mears. Of the current drivers, Tony Kanon has two wins in 2003 and 2004 while Harry Kashinevis won in 2002. The event used to be held twice a year in March or April and October or November from 1964 until 1986. Then it became a March or April only event. It was part of the USAC calendar until 1978, then on the cart schedule from 1979 to 1995, before being an IndyCar event for a decade until it fell off the calendar after the 2005 race due to low attendance. Now in 2016, the race is back as the only mile ish long oval on the calendar. The track got reconfigured in 2011 with the dog leg made more outward, so the track is measured at 1.022 miles now. That means the race of 250 laps will be 255.5 miles in length, the longest edition of the event. It used to be a mix of a 150 lap spring race and then 200 lap autumn race in the 60s 
before becoming a 150 mile long event, then a 200 mile race for 20 years from 1986. Out of the current field apart from Canaan and Castro Neves, Scott Dixon and Ed Kamta have also previously raced here in IndyCar. Out of the teams, Penske has the most experience around here and is the most successful with seven wins, including the last one in 2005 with Sam Hornish Jr. Andretti have two wins thanks to Canaan and Rahul at Manangan Racing has one win due to team owner Bobby Rahul in 1992. The track is banked everywhere with 10 to 11 degree banking in turns 1 and 2 in the doll leg and 8 to 9 degree banking in turns 3 and 4. There's 3 degree banking on the front stretch and 10 to 8 degree banking on the back stretch. With the track also repaved during the 2011 reconfiguration and the high downforce package from the February test used for this weekend, expect a fast and furious event with speeds much faster than the old that records. It is fantastic to see IndyCar return to a track with so much single seater history. However, that doesn't make for a great race. The Aero Pack here, trophy of the drivers delivered that. But who's going to be taking the checkered flag on Saturday night, Sunday morning? Well, let's explore that in the predictions section. Well, if you take away the square root of double birds times tyre saving divided by three wide restarts, that means fuck all. However, looking at what happened in testing in February and well done being Penske, they look incredibly well placed to win again. Harry Kester never set the fastest time during that test with a 190.894 mile per hour lap and is a previous winner here. The Brazilian also badly needs to snap a win this streak of almost two years of that last win coming in the second race in Detroit in 2014. All his teammates have to be in consideration, I know Pagano has never won a short oval, Power only has one win at one at Milwaukee in 2014, and Montoya's last win at a track of similar length was at Gateway in 2000. You also have to throw into the mix the other usual suspects like Scott Dixon, Tony Kanaan, of course a former two-time race winner here, and the last winner at a short oval, Ryan hunter Ray. Last year's win out of the Milwaukee Mile, Sebastian Bourdais would also be chucked in, but we have to see how much the truck fire on Wednesday has affected the team and car. Therefore, I'm going for a guy who performed well in the February test, as the Honda Aero kit looked pretty sharp. Of course, the test is probably no indication for how well anyone will perform with teams and drivers primarily figuring out their setups, but this is a driver who badly needs a win with a drought of almost five years. Marco Andretti last won at a short oval in Iowa in 2011. But he didn't have the best birthday in the opening round at St. Peter's. He made a few errors to end up 15th. The 29-year-old has good records at the short ovals in this DW12 IR 15-16 era with poles in Milwaukee and podiums apart from that win at Iowa. He finished in the top 10 at both short ovals last year and he's due another win as he usually gets them every five years. Apart from Andretti, look out for Honda counterparts Ray Hall and Sato, and North American buddies New Garden and Hinch, who has a particularly strong record on the short ovals. With it being an oval, that means Ed Kamta is back, and has a lot to prove after last year. I know his best race last year was that Ida in Iowa with Karam. Plus, he's one of the few drivers with previous experience here, so you can't rule out Uncle Ed. IndyCar is in the only series at Felix. The Mazda Road to Indy is there to support its big bro with the Indy Lights Championship. Carlin's Felix Serralis leaves the championship from Junkers' Carl Kaiser and fellow Felix Rosenquist of Ballardi after the opening rounds in St. Pete. The series also supported IndyCar's February test where Smith Peterson Motorsports dominated. RC Anderson was the fastest on the day with 168.214 mile per hour lap, head of Santa Uratada and Andre Negrau. The best non smith driver was Serralis, then Andretti's Dean Stoneman rounded out the top five. Just like with the IndyCar test, teams were very much testing setups though, but Uratada did point out that it did seem difficult to overtake, so there could be more emphasis on doing well in qualifying. It's tough to bet against Anderson recovering from a disappointing weekend in St. Pete by winning in Phoenix. The 19-year-old was the best overall performer in the series last year, finishing fourth in the Freedom 100 at Indianapolis, then grabbing podiums in Milwaukee and Iowa. He's certainly handy at turning left. Challenging the American could be Carlin if they get it right, like Iowa last season, with Ed Jones who finished second then, and last year's winner at the Milwaukee Mile, Serralis. Kaiser was decent on the ovals last year with two top five finishes out of the three oval races, but the biggest challenge could come from Zach Veach, who in 2014 with Andretti finished third at Indianapolis, second at Pocono, and one in Milwaukee. 
He's only finished outside of the top five once in eight Indy Lights oval races, which also makes him the most experienced oval racer in the field. On the other hand, Rosenquist, Negrau and Stoneman will be making their first ever oval start, while Scott Hargrove, Uatada, Dalton Kellett, Sacri Clermont de Meadow, Neil Albarico and Hermen Choi will be making their first Indy Lights oval appearances. With over half the field experience and their first taste of Indy Lights oval racing, hope the race is relatively clean and we get some fast and furious racing on Saturday. However, this round is an unknown. We have no idea what happened in the races, and that's why I'm really looking forward to this event. Just not the staying up part. European brethren, will you be staying up as well? Who do you think will win in IndyCar and Indy Lights? And how will the races go? Will we be talking about a successful return to Felix for single seater racing? Let me know your thoughts down below, and I will be back next week to review the races. So, stay up for watching, and I will see you next time.